Hello there. Recently, it was confirmed that Philip Schofield, a British TV personality, had hidden a secret relationship he had with a much younger male member of staff. There has rightfully been an uproar, not least because Schofield lied to many people, including his wife and children. Schofield has now left his job and lost the TV jobs that were planned for him. All these ex-colleagues are coming out of the woodwork and telling us what a toxic environment he was part of. His career appears to be all but over, but I don't feel sorry for him. He was an adult in an inappropriate relationship with someone who looked up to him and wanted to be like him. He has denied grooming the lad, but many people have a problem with that. I cover this issue more fully in my video, The Downfall, this morning, but I wondered what Survivor and charity boss Emma J. Taylor thought. Have a listen. When we're talking about the Schofield case and, you know, obviously when he met him and when he had a relationship, what I can't get my head around is the fact that more and more people are beginning to accept that grooming happens and it's an OK thing. And it really isn't. For me, it's manipulation at, at its highest. It's not a love story. The damage it's, uh, that are caused before because of it are of acute concern children. you know I've worked with children uh, for years in the performing arts arena my focus is always to get that child uh, through the arts so to build their self-belief their determination their skills get them out into the world with confidence regardless of whether they go into uh, the performing world or not at no point in all of the years have I come across anyone in my team who felt it appropriate it's to get close with a young performer and then go on to the date that person. That would just feel very weird. In fact, that would just feel quite stomach churning. I agree with Emma Jane that whatever Schofield claims now, it's difficult not to have a problem with his role in the abuse of power over a starstruck young lad. But it got me thinking how the public respond completely differently to the alleged grooming of a boy to the way that it responds to the alleged grooming of a girl. For decades, young females have been normalized as arm candy for rich, famous, and much older men. People have barely batted an eyelid, even when the girls haven't been old enough to consent to such a relationship. Now, don't get me wrong. I fully understand the evolutionary process of fertility and why a woman in her 20s may be more appealing to men than a woman in her 40s. I don't have much of an issue with that. That's nature. Neither am I interested in going after 18-year-old boys who are dating 16-year-old girls, because even though there may be an age gap, it's not significant and they are closer in age. But here's the thing that gets me. There's a joke doing the rounds that Leonardo DiCaprio's latest girlfriend wanted to attend his film premiere, but it was on a school night. Of course, I'm not suggesting that DiCaprio is a paedophile, just noting it's still a laughing matter when older men date young females, as is DiCaprio's thing. Now, just to reassure you, this is not a feminist rant. I have never claimed to be a feminist, uh, but that's a whole other story. And neither is it an anti-male rant. It's just not common for rich, famous females to have groomed teenage boys or it might be happening, but it's significantly less visible because unlike old men with young girls, it's not acceptable, which is really the point of this report. The normalization of predatory behavior towards young girls at the hands of rich and famous men. For me, it's interesting to know how we respond, the sort of different values we place on young boys and young girls who are being groomed. By the end of this report, my aim is to have armed at least one person, at least one person, one parent or carer against the intoxicating mix of fame and money and to make it easier to resist the seduction of it and perhaps protect your child. I come from a background in entertainment, having been a music journalist for over a decade in my 20s and 30s. As a young music journalist, I would frequently attend parties where older industry men surrounded themselves with young, pretty females desperate to get on in the music industry. Mariah Carey is one such example. She was a waitress who wanted to sing when she met the head of Columbia Records. After meeting Mariah, Tommy Mottola wrote in his book that the two of them were flirtatious from the moment that he had set eyes on her.
at a party. Tommy Matolo was 38. Mariah Carey was 18. He was married with two children. Creepy much. In 1990, Matola signed Carey to a music contract and announced the end of his 19-year marriage. Three years later, Carey and Matola wed. She was 24. He was 44. She has talked at length about how much she hated that time, how she was controlled by him, including who she was friends with, and felt locked up in her gilded cage. But some people see that as a worthwhile trade-off for ending up as one of the biggest singing stars in the world. A similar example is Celine Dion, who met her manager, René Angelil, when she was 12. As with everything, there are anomalies. In the case of Mariah Carey and Celine Dion, it was the female who's ultimately the more famous of the partners. So Angelil had uh, discovered Celine Dion. She was 12. He was 26 years older than her. They married when she was 20. Celine has referred in interview to having to keep her love secret and other obvious stuff. So I'm fairly certain they were having a sexual relationship from very early. Angelil mortgaged his house in 1981 in order to pay for Dion's first album, clearly indicating just how much he believed in her stardom and how committed to her he already was. It was, of course, throughout their time working together that things turned romantic between Dion and Angelil, and it is claimed that when Dion was 19, the pair went on their first date. Do I believe that? Not really. Celine, of course, has turned into a weird creature these days and flogs genderless clothes, for children that look awfully satanic. I expect more and many of these women are damaged by the experience of grooming, whether they realise it or not. So let's look have so let's have a look at a current case regarding this issue. Aerosmith frontman Steve Tyler is being sued by a woman he dated for three years when she was a teen and he was in his twenties. Julia Misley, formerly known as Julia Holcomb, claimed Tyler used his fame and status to groom, manipulate and sexually assault her when she was 16. Now, for many people, details of this relationship are already out in the open. Tyler did not hide it, which says a great deal about the normalisation of this behaviour. In fact, in Tyler's own memoir, he wrote... I almost took a teen bride. She was 16. She knew how to nasty and there wasn't a hair on it. He called the girl Diana. Julia claims she is Diana. I'm sorry for the graphic nature of that quote, but that tells you how depraved some of these men are. Another extract of his book read, I went and slept at her parents' house for a couple of nights and her parents fell in love with me. They signed papers over to me to have custody so I wouldn't get arrested if I took her out of the state. I took her on tour with me. Stephen Tyler is denying all allegations against him. Misley's complaint states that she met Tyler in 1973 at an Aerosmith concert in Oregon. She said she was invited backstage and later to Tyler's hotel room where she says he sexually um, assaulted her. It's alleged that he then had her flown to an Aerosmith concert in Seattle where he sexually assaulted her again. The following year, Tyler met with Misley's mother and convinced her to sign over the guardianship to him. I've listened to Julie's testimony and it's shocking. She was in an in inappropriate relationship with him, no doubt, and she was pregnant. He went on the road. He left her at home. He controlled her, didn't want her to go out. He sent a friend two weeks later to take her shopping. The next thing she remembered was waking up in a burning apartment. She was rescued by firefighters and taken to hospital. It gets worse. When Stephen Tyler arrived, he told her she would have to have an abortion before she left the hospital. She didn't want to. She was five months along and thought she actually had a life with this man because she was young, inexperienced, vulnerable and easy to control. He gave her an ultimatum there and then, abort this baby or you will lose me. She was so young, she was in love with him. The story that follows is utterly shocking, but it involves her being given a saline abortion, her baby boy being born alive and killed at that point in front of Tyler. She said that Tyler was full of fear about that moment and said God would punish him. I appreciate it's a grotesque and graphic story, but it says so much about how self-involved 
these rich and famous predators are. They are so used to complete adoration and sycophancy, they think nothing of coldly disposing of these young girls when life becomes a bit too real. Now, Julia Misley said of her lawsuit, I want this action to expose an industry that protects celebrity offenders to cleanse and hold accountable an industry that both exploited and allowed me to be exploited for years, along with so many other naive and vulnerable kids and adults. Now, as I say, Tyler maintains that Julia consented to their sexual relationship and he had immunity as her legal guardian at the time that the alleged events occurred. He wants the lawsuit dismissed entirely. So you see, this is a case where parents actively handed over their child to a famous person for reasons unknown, but likely to be massively influenced by their celebrity and their wealth. Julia's situation is repeated throughout this report. It's a lethal combination of young, impressionable girls, parents who failed to protect them, and often because they were absolutely in awe and somehow benefited from the liaison and the toxic power of fame and how it corrupts and weakens much that it touches. And honestly, frankly, with mothers like Julia's, who needs enemies, right? With parents like Julius, who needs enemies? Sign, let, just sign your child over to a rock star who can take her out of state. And uh, I mean, Brooke Shields had a very similar situation as one example. She was paraded as a sexual object when she was a child with the full and grotesque backing of her own mother. So, yes, some parents are definitely problematic when it comes to fame and actually how they forget to be a parent um, when they encounter the sparkle of showbiz. Fame frequently makes people completely untouchable. Some are so arrogant. They're just so unbelievably arrogant that they admit their inappropriate behavior in their memoirs. Take Anthony Kiedis from Red Hot Chili Peppers as one example, right? And uh, who openly admits to raping underage girls, including a 14-year-old when he was in his 20s. He once told a story of a Catholic schoolgirl who went to his concert and he slept with her. He eventually found out she was 14 and her father was a chief of police. Kiedis said, and I quote, I did want to get her the hell back home right away. So we had sex one more time. Let me remind you, he was in his mid 20s. She was a kid of 14 that he knew. It wasn't sex. It was rape. Of course, he doesn't call it rape, but that's what sex with an underage person is because they're unable to consent. You know, I get it. These rock and pop guys look great to teen girls. I had my own crushes when I was a teenager and who knows? I mean, perhaps if I'd have been given that opportunity, I'd gone to a concert, I'd been asked to go backstage. Wouldn't that be the ultimate bonus to be able to go backstage and meet the star of the show? But it's not a fair match. The power is all with the famous one, including how they are protected when they show their predatory nature. And what about the role of the parent and carer? Where are they when their child, no matter how apparently worldly wise, are thrust into being adults before their time? I thought for the purposes of this, it would be interesting to go back a century and see if things were different. Turns out they're not. They weren't. Take, for example, silent movie superstar Charlie Chaplin and his curious relationship with young Lita Gray, who was eight when she first met Chaplin. She was 12 when she began working at his Hollywood studio, 15 when she was said to have reconnected with him over uh, doing more movies, and 16 when she was pregnant by him. Here they are together. I mean, I don't know about you, but this just feels really nasty and Lolita-ish. Look, there's the devil giving the innocent young girl over to the nasty predator, a celebrated Hollywood star. Chaplin was in his mid-30s at the time. It was said they got married to avoid him being prosecuted because Lita was pregnant. I will never not feel that the men who do this aren't creeps. They are. There's no getting around it. Talking about which, this one is creepy with bells on. Great balls of fireman, Jerry Lee Lewis, marrying his first cousin, once removed, Myra Gale Brown, when he was 22 and she was 13. I mean, how many what the 
can you have in one statement? Now, that was one of the very few occasions when the coupling of a young girl and an older man was a scandal and it was compounded by them being related. Myra had become close to Lewis. Lewis was in a band with Myra's father, who was Lewis's first cousin. Um, Lewis moved in with uh, Jay Brown and his family when Myra was 12. And a year later, in December 1957, at the age of 13, Myra married Lewis. He was 22 in Mississippi. And it was only when Lewis was actually on tour and came to the UK and revealed to reporters that Myra was his wife, that the stuff properly hit the fan. Lewis claimed that Brown was 15 years old. I mean, still, what the and was had been his wife of two months. However, it was discovered she was actually only 13 and had been his wife of five months. This caused an absolute uproar, and after a few shows, the tour was cancelled, added to which Lewis had not yet divorced his first wife. Um, after Lewis finalised the divorce to his first wife, he married or remarried Brown in June 1958. And the scandal over the marriage pretty much destroyed Lewis's rock and roll career, but he ended up making it quite big in country music. Um, but by 1970, Lewis's drug addiction, alcoholism, infidelity had pretty much destroyed the marriage. They Brown filed for a divorce on the grounds of adultery and abuse. And uh, she said that, in quotes, that she had been subject to every type of physical and mental abuse imaginable. Their divorce was finalised in December 1970. They had two children. Myra, an author these days, wrote two books about her experience, and one became the movie Great Balls of Fire with Dennis Quaid and Winona Ryder playing the role of Myra. And talking about predators of rock and roll, what about the so-called king himself? Elvis Presley and Priscilla Bowley met in Germany when she was 14 and he was 24. Hollywood just immortalised their romance on the big screen and at a huge ceremony. Apparently, Elvis and Priscilla's relationship, according to them, merely involved lying in bed with their arms around each other nightly but not having sex until they were married. We've heard this repeatedly. It wasn't sexual until it was legal. Blah, blah, blah. Right. Let's say I'm extremely sceptical about rich, powerful men who can have many of the women that they want, yet choosing to be with someone but not have sex with them. Yeah, right. I don't buy it. What about Jimmy Page, who allegedly began an affair with Laurie Maddox when she was 14 years old and he was in his late 20s? Page appears never to have addressed this scandal, but Laurie claimed that he basically, in her words, kidnapped her after telling her he was going to be with her, then often left her at the hotel with security at the door. We've heard this before, these girls being guarded by the security of these rich and famous men. Uh, Laurie also claimed to have slept with David Bowie when she was underage. Again, this wasn't denied. Um, now, the next story I recall happening in real time and was utterly appalled at how this young girl was let down by all those around her, including her own mother, um, who by all visual accounts loved living the rock and roll lifestyle that her young daughter had brought her way. I'm referring, of course, to Bill Wyman, of the Rolling Stones and 13 year old Mandy Smith. Um, he met Mandy in 1984, he was 47. He married Mandy after she turned 18. Smith said they had had sex when she was 14. Wyman claimed her mother had approved of the relationship. Yes, we could all see that all over the tabloids at the time. And that was a double betrayal to young Mandy, right? We have normalized this behavior so much that even the youngest member of the world's most famous reality family was involved in such a situation and hardly an eye was batted. I believe this young woman is a victim of a family that sexualized all its girls and is now sexualizing their young daughters and in turn, their young fans. I'm referring to Kylie Jenner, the youngest of the Kardashian Jenner clan who was involved with Tiger, the rapper, when she was young. She first met him at her sister Kendall's birthday party when she was 14 and he was 23. There were rumours that uh, they were dating when she was 17. Just days 
after Tiger denied they were dating, Kanye West, who at the time was married to Kim Kardashian, Kylie's uh, half-sister said, I think he got in early. I think he was smart, which is a repugnant comment at best. Kylie's sister, Khloe Kardashian, an enabler of these things, sought to justify her youngest sister being used as a sex toy and said she herself was probably having sex at 16 with men in their 20s and added that, in quotes, Kylie is not a normal 17-year-old. No, she wouldn't be, would she, being raised in that family? Because the Kardashians and Jenners have been raised to be sexual object, objects by their mum, Kris Jenner. It was Chris who organised the selling and distribution of Kim's sex tape, which launched the whole family. You know, because, of course, all mums monetize their daughters having sex so all the, all the rest of their family can be rich and famous. You know, if the Kardashians aren't careful, all of their daughters will also be turned into sexual objects. It's noticeable to me that the Kardashian and Jenner women can barely pose with their daughters without thrusting out their jutting breasts, sticking out their adapted bottoms, standing on their toes you know, in very sexual poses. It's like they, they, they're just incapable of being anything except sexual objects, which is really sad. You know, it's grotesque and they are actually influencing millions of young girls. Um, and it, it, it's horrible. And let me ask you this. What report of this nature would be complete without mention of Woody Allen and the adopted daughter of his then partner? Some background. Alan at the time was with actress Mia Farrow, who was sort of an early day Angelina Jolie with the adopting of children from the sort of far flung parts of the world. In August 1992, Dylan Farrow, Alan's seven-year-old adopted daughter, claimed that Alan had sexually molested her. Alan has repeatedly denied the allegation. At that point, Alan and Farrow, Alan and Farrow had been together in a 12-year relationship. The sexual abuse is alleged to have taken place eight months after Farrow learned that Alan actually had started a sexual relationship with another one of her adopted daughters, Sun Yi. Um, and Sun Yi married Alan in 1997. Sun Yi at the time was a first year undergraduate. She was 21 years old when uh, Farrow eventually found out about the relationship. Alan alleged that the relationship prompted Farrow to concoct the molestation allegation as an act of vengeance. Police, state attorney and a hospital concluded that Alan had not or had likely not sexually abused Dylan and the allegation was likely coached or influenced by Mia Farrow. Oh, Dylan has repeated the allegation several times as an adult, sort of modified and slightly different than the original narrative, but nonetheless still saying that this took place. So, but... Nothing has been proven regarding Alan and Dylan. As I say, Alan has repeatedly denied it. Um, but there has been plenty proven regarding Sun Yi. I don't know about you, but any adult man who dates his long-term partner's child is a wrong one to me, right? And you can take that to the bank. Woody Allen, in my opinion, is a wrong one to have done that, right? Some of these women are clearly troubled. They clearly come from quite disturbed backgrounds. Take, for example, Courtney Stodden. Courtney, like many of the girls I refer to here, have been repeatedly failed by those around them. Courtney ended up marrying actor Doug Hutchins, who was in his 50s at the time, and she was 16. It required parental consent. Of course, it ended badly. These couplings are not fairy tales, far from it. Uh, these are older men, almost always controlling these younger girls. It just makes my skin crawl more than I can really articulate, to be frank with you. I've seen Courtney in a couple of TV programs and she is performatively sexualized. She's highly sexualized. It's so sad to watch. All the signs of her having been an abused child are there. And uh, then, of course, she married this middle-aged man and essentially continued the abuse, in my opinion. People tittered and made her the butt of their jokes, and she stayed married to him until inevitably they divorced. Um, consent for the marriage was given by her mother. Really just shameful, frankly. Speaking of 
her mother, Stodden said, my mum has gotten a lot of hate and I understand why. If I ever have a baby and I'm raising that baby from my own experiences, I would never sign my kid off ever to an adult man who is 34 years older. These young girls with famous men do not elicit concern in the same way as other kinds of child abuse, but it should. Look at these females. They were young and, in my opinion, groomed by these predatory men. Just because in the examples of R&B star Aaliyah, Mariah Carey and Celine Dion, they went on to enjoy immense fame and success as a result of the coupling, it does not make it right. In fact, I want to end this report in memory of young Aaliyah, who was married to multiple predator R. Kelly when she was 14, 15 and he was 27. Witnesses claimed that R. Kelly had begun raping Aaliyah when she was just 13. Sadly, Aaliyah didn't survive to be a survivor. She was killed in a plane crash in 2001. Of course, it's iffy. Aaliyah was a young girl brought into the music industry by her uncle and passed around various industry men before her sad death. She was just a child, abused by men with power because of their fame and wealth and because they could get away with it. She was a victim, just like all the young people mentioned in this report. We need less hero worship of predators and more condemning of them. The time of entertainment industry molestation needs to be over, and these predators need to be stripped of their acclaim and revealed for who they really are. And it's that simple. They are common or garden rapists with money and fame, nothing more. Hero worship has enabled this abuse and it's time it stopped.